the Deschutes River is a remarkable river and there's a quote from a 1914 USGS study that says it's the most even flowing river of its size anywhere in the United States. People have a passion for the river. Everybody does. It's kind of the lifeblood. It's the water that runs through the town. You know, our bodies are made up of water. We're, we're so intrinsically related to water. Watermaster is a person who regulates water use among water right holders in a particular basin. They measure streams, they make reservoir releases, and they make sure people are complying with Oregon water law. I like to look at a water master as someone who knows something about everything related to water in that basin. Bob Main was a remarkable person. He had a mind like few that I've ever known. His knowledge of this basin, of the streams, the creeks, the rivers, was truly remarkable. If we got a lot of rain and snow, we would start to see the effects of that late next summer. I can't say that I, uh, I know all of the water masters across the West, but uh, Bob was truly unique. The water master is the most important decision maker in a watershed about how water gets managed, where it goes, who gets it, how much they get it, when they get it. And so if you care about things like fish and water quality and farms, the water master is the most important person. And the special thing about Bob was he had that power and he was in that position and he did his job remarkably well in an even-handed, fair manner. And as a result, we have a resource that's much better off today. A brief history of the development of the Deschutes Basin, which of course is really the story of the development of water. The settlers that came to Oregon, they came wandering through the Bend country and didn't stop because it, it didn't look like a place where the geography would allow a, a family farm to, to get going and prosper. So they went by the bend and headed over to the valley where anybody that lived along a river could scratch a ditch and bring the water to their farm, their little garden, and grow food. In Central Oregon, folks realized it's gonna take an organization. It's going to take districts. It's gonna take a collection of efforts to divert that water from the river. So right around 1900 is when activity really got started in the Deschutes Basin. The first significant canal constructed out of the Deschutes River was 1899, right at well, what is now about Portland Avenue. The next canal was 1900. The next canal after that was about 1905, 19. 11. The last major canal, the priority date is 1913, uh, although it was not constructed until the late 1930s. Those six canals uh, together are able to divert the entire flow of the Deschutes River. The earliest developments were by private capital. Most of them operated under what was called the Carry Act. The Carry Act said, settle the land, irrigate a little bit of it, and we'll give you a title to the, to the whole. It was under the Carry Act then that these private development companies built the canals, constructed starting in 1905, and finished about 1910. One of the uh, lawyers for the Carriac companies here in Central Oregon was Oswald West, who became the governor of Oregon, it was associated with a canal company that went bankrupt. But then that wasn't hard to do because all the canal companies went bankrupt at one time or another. Consistently, between 1902, the Newlands Act, and the middle of the 20th century, not just in Oregon, but elsewhere in California, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, Colorado, these irrigation projects on the whole were dismal failures. Turns out they were all undercapitalized. You could not finance the development and the operation just out of land sales and annual assessments. 
The technology used at the time to create these works, dams, head gates, canals, was um, adequate in most respects for the era, especially if you were in normal, um, working in normal kinds of soils, especially if there was any clay that was available. In lava lands, they weren't so, so good. They had problems. Could anybody in this country, meaning the arid west, establish an irrigation project without a full commitment of the federal government? And the answer was, as with uh, so many other things of this sort in the 20th century, no. The other important player was the Bureau of Reclamation. The Reclamation Act was passed in 1902, and it was an effort by the federal government to subsidize, let's not kid around about it, to encourage and subsidize the development of agri agriculture in the arid west. Central Oregon was studied by reclamation, but didn't look that attractive to begin with. C.C. Fisher, in one of his reports for the Bureau of Reclamation, said that the whole idea of the Deschutes project was ludicrous because they were going to lose up to 40% of their water uh, just getting it from the impoundment to any of the fields that they thought they were going to deliver the water to. Finally, the reclamation came back to Central Oregon during the Depression. The federal government was desperate to try and inject some money back into the, into the West. So the federal government agreed to build the North Unit Project and to assist in the rebuilding of the Ochico Irrigation Project. There's more land in Central Oregon than there is water to serve it. That's still true. It became evident early on that storage of water was going to be necessary for full development. By the time the Bureau of Reclamation came back into the basin during the Depression, it was evident that these early construction jobs by these private companies uh, had to undergo major repairs. The rock crib dams rotted away. That was the obvious one. Uh, so Crane Prairie and Crescent Lake were both rebuilt by the, by the Bureau in the late 30s and early 40s. And the um, Ochoco Dam was rebuilt by Reclamation in 1949 for similar reasons. Then the biggest storage project or two of them that came along later were Wickiup Reservoir, which was entirely built by Reclamation, and Prineville Reservoir, which was built by Reclamation in 1960-61. They share the river system as their avenue for delivering water, and that's what attracted me to this basin to begin with, was with a with one conduit to move water from three storage reservoirs to six different irrigation districts allowed one to manage water like you couldn't even dream of doing in the John Day Basin. So that's really why I wanted to come here. Not because I like Ben better than John Day, but here, here you could make a decision about how water will be managed and it mattered. You could put it into effect. Essentially, the story for Central Oregon was written from 1900 to about 1960. 60 years went from a essentially uninhabited cold desert to what we knew when we moved here. Water rights, though, are a form of property right, and as such, they have some important constitutional protections. Roughly, the government of Oregon made promises to settlers. 
and the promise was you settle the land and put the water to work we'll give you title to the land and we will give you title to the right to continue to use the water for that purpose. Being a property right, it is in part protected by the U.S. Constitution and the Oregon Constitution, which says you can't change your mind <laughs> without compensating people if you're going to take, take that property away from them. Bob took water as something that belongs to everybody, but also something that benefits everybody. And so if you had a right to water, he was sure you were going to get it. If you didn't have a right to water and you were trying to steal it, he was sure you weren't going to do that either. In 1950, the water that was running down the river and out to the ocean was considered essentially wasted water. It didn't do the work the only economy here in 1950 was lumber and agriculture and selling ice cream to us when we came over on vacation. Today we've got a greater appreciation for the value of water in our streams, the fish and wildlife habitat that's so, uh, so essential and so rare in this arid landscape. Bob understood that because Bob wasn't just thinking about his clients those who were using the water for their livelihoods. And he understood that we truly needed to have these streams, these creeks, these rivers alive and functioning. That there was more that, uh, that could be produced for the community than simply hay crop, alfalfa, etc. The quality of life in Bend and Central Oregon is so good that when the growth occurred in the 1970s, 1980s, and then 1990s, where we had many people coming here, not because they wanted to grow food and irrigate, but they wanted to recreate. All those folks that came here saw the river differently from when the settlers came here and saw the river as a source of life. The folks now see it as a source of recreation. And those interests and values have changed the landscape of the Deschutes River. Well, now lumber is almost non-existent. Agriculture economically is not nearly as important and kayaking and rafting and fishing have a much larger economic role than, than they used to and that can lead people to conclude well gosh we should uh, we should change our minds we should manage water for the benefit of kayaking and rafting and fisheries instead of irrigation except for the fact that there is this promise made. So we have a conflict between existing uses that were granted to the irrigation districts a long time ago, and Oregon's water code is based on those water rights. So we can't change that, but we can say that, hey, how can we do things differently? Is there any room for improvement? And of course, there's major areas that can be improved. Bob was really able to think out of the box Bob cared a lot, but he was also not a rabid environmentalist, right? He had an environmental ethic. He also cared about people. He understood that this river served the needs of many, many people and a whole farming community and that the place was settled because of the water in the river. His ability to talk to an irrigator and then talk to an environmentalist and understand the needs of both and then be able to bring those two together was, I think, fairly unique when it comes to water masters. I think if you talk to his clients, they'd tell you that Bob was a good water master. He did his best to get them the water that they needed. But Bob knew that more was possible, and he knew that the proverbial win-win was always a possibility. Seepage losses in the canal are somewhere between 30 and 60 percent. We like to use an average of about 45, 50 percent. You need to divert twice the amount of water from the river than you need on farm just to get it to the farm. So by conserving water, piping and lining of ditches, or instituting other irrigation efficiency technology, you can save an enormous quantity of water. Now what the state enabled us to do with this in-stream water right, this Conserved Water Act, was to create a new in-stream water right from those savings. So we had two units going to the field and one ending up there. Now we have one unit going in-stream and one unit going to the field to irrigate 
and the same amount of acres are still being irrigated. It's just done more efficiently. Nobody got hurt. The farmers are still irrigating. The farmers still have the same water rights that they had before. The City of Sisters has been growing. It needs water too. Lo and behold, it gets the water it needs. So the three major demanders of water, if you will, the environment and our cities and our farmers are all getting the water they need. The great thing is, and, and we can tie this back to Bob Main, is in the state in 1987 passed the In-Stream Water Rights Act, which said that you can take a water right, lease it in-stream or transfer it in-stream permanently, and that water right will retain the priority date. And so through leases and transfers, we take a water right from the land and you put it in stream, maintains that priority date, the water master can then regulate for that in-stream water right. And that's really the bulk of the work that has been done in the basin is taking those existing water rights and transferring, leasing them in stream. At the same time, that 1987 In-Stream Water Rights Act, also a portion of that was called the Conservation Act, where a person can take a leaky section of canal, pipe it, take the conserved water, put it in stream, and it'll also re retain the old priority date. So then we have increased stream flow through conservation. And so he was really on the front line with figuring out things like how to lease water in stream, where you're protecting a farmer's irrigation rights at the same time you're restoring flows in stream. Very innovative. Of course, he didn't create the state law that enabled it to happen, but he was one of the first guys to pick it up and say, this is what we do, and this is how we can do it. Bob found those opportunities for efficiency, those opportunities where somebody wasn't using their water to try and keep it in stream. The end result was pretty revolutionary in terms of getting the irrigation district to make some management changes uh, that were good for them also, but were a big shift from how they'd done business for close to 100 years. We're trying to optimize the river and try to return it to historical conditions as much as we can. At the same time, we're trying to make sure that those uh, historical old out-of-stream uses are still being met in full. The flow of the Deschutes River north of Bend has gone from 30 second feet to close to 100 because of those purchases. So we've made huge strides. We've gone a lot further than I thought we would get this time. I thought it would be slower than this. Nonetheless, we still irrigate about the same number of acres that we did at the maximum build out. We do it though with less water. Well, we've seen a, a drastic change in the basin towards a lot more in-stream flows. And we run the system quite a bit tighter than it was run historically. And uh, thanks to uh, satellite telemetry and things like that, we can really uh, change the flows when they need to be changed right away. And so we're trying to put every drop of water in the basin to its most beneficial use. When you suggest, well, okay, go ahead and change your mind, but compensate people, there hasn't been an institution around to do that. And really what the Deschutes River Conservancy, kind of the foundation of its purpose, what it's there for is to create an institution to do exactly that, to compensate people so we can change our mind. Wyshoes Creek runs through the center of Camp Polka Meadow. When we first started here in uh, 2000, after several years of working to acquire it, the creek had been shunted off to the side. I didn't know much about this creek until my friend Bob Main directed us over this way. It was little known to me, it was little known to most of the folks in the community. It had long since been forgotten. But because Bob directed us over this way, we realized there was real opportunity with the prospect of someday bringing salmon and steelhead back up to Wyshoes Creek. We've invested a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money, but uh, this has been a remarkable story of bringing a long dead creek back to life. You know, it doesn't take uh, a rocket scientist to understand that these critical areas, the streams, the floodplains, are essential to life here in the high desert. Nobody understood that better than Bob. Did Bob make enemies? No, Bob didn't make enemies. Was he adverse with people? Oftentimes. 
And when he was adverse with somebody, he didn't leave until he was sure that they understood why he was doing what he was doing. And that made them feel better at the end because Bob was never in a hurry. And he never said, you have to do it because I said so. He said, you have to do it and here's why. Bob Main was an incredible mentor. So many people have learned so much from him and his leadership was very important to my organization, the Deschutes River Conservancy, and to many other organizations who he worked with so closely. So because of guys like Bob, we have a bright future in the Deschutes Basin and we can be very thankful for that. Bob Main obviously was constrained by the, the rules, the regulations, the statutes, the traditions of water here in the West. But within that framework, within that paradigm, Bob has managed to do things that very few places have done. Here in Central Oregon, we've managed to find ways to serve the needs of irrigators, local communities, while also restoring streams. There aren't many places in the West that that's happened without a lot of friction, without a lot of fighting. Bob helped lead the way. He certainly wasn't alone, but he inspired a great number of folks here in Central Oregon to find ways to solve our problems, work together and find a, a common good and resolve our issues, produce something that generations to come will, uh, will truly be thankful for. Where would we be today if Bob hadn't been one of the, the pioneers of uh, creative water management in the basin? I think you only have to look to our neighbors to the south and the Klamath Basin to see what happens when people go in their bunkers and aren't willing to talk to their colleagues that maybe have different opinions than them. And I think that you can have some pretty bad outcomes. Unfortunately, Bob and others were there early on to make sure that we charted a different course in the Deschutes Basin. His legacy could be probably described as someone who was innovative, was forward thinking, looked down the road and said, hey, we don't have to do things the same way. There are other ways to do things and we can do them better. He was one of the people that's first rate. He could hold his own against anybody, anywhere, any place, anytime. So the trajectory that this river is on is very positive and will continue to be for many years to come into the future. And Bob gets a lot of credit for that. And so I think that future generations, while they may not know who Bob was, uh, will be reaping the rewards of his work for, for decades to come. We owe a great debt to, uh, to Bob Main. It's, it's an amazing legacy.